Welcome to the podcast, Brian Steele. I'm Ooh. so glad to be here. Welcome yeah. back to the podcast, I should say. Right. I'm glad I made the cut yes. a second time after the first episode. <laughs> this we is the first time we've you. had a double guest, right? Yes. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. true. Garrett, okay. beware. Suitably, it's, <laughs> it's Brian. So if you, if you listeners didn't listen to the first time we had Brian on the podcast, you should go back and find that episode and listen to it because that one was awesome. And this one is going to be just as awesome. Super looking forward to it. We or should tell them so. the last one he was on for was, it's called, how do I recognize spiritual abuse? Yeah. So def- definitely a different vibe than this one. Yeah. Light definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So if that sounds interesting to you, go have a listen. Um, and we'll, we'll keep you on the hook about what we're going to talk about. Actually, you already know because of the um, episode title, but we'll get into that in a bit. But first I want to kick us off with a fun question, which is this, you know how sometimes people ask, what would your everyday superpower be if you could choose one Mm. i'm not asking what would it be i want to know what your everyday superpower is that you do have Mm. oh Oh, gosh what are you like exceptionally good at that's just kind of a random thing oh can i start Mm -hmm. yeah i have an amazing ability for typing oh i can be in a meeting and i can record word for word i can go to a conference like at Global Leadership Summit, I can actually record word for word typing. I can make a transcript. Yes, I can do that. What's wow. your WPM? Uh, probably close to 100. Oh, it's probably way more than 100. It might be. <laughs> it's but, probably like 140. So not just type, but I can organize the organize the notes. Mm. I can get action steps. Oh, yeah, steps. you're, you're, so you're way bulleted. higher than 100. Wow. Like, that's it, it is a that superpower. Is a superpower. Yeah. And that, that's, a, that's actually really advantageous to you. Like that's a great one to have. It's it, one that I would maybe choose to have. It's super helpful until it becomes the expectation that mm, I'm going to take the notes. Ryan's in, in the meeting. note taker. Yeah, yeah. That's true. So. Good point. Mm-hmm. I would say I'm learning that I struggle to just say positive things about myself. Have you noticed <laughs> the last few questions have been where I'm trying to get you guys to hype yourselves up? Yes, I have. Is that your superpower? That you, I, that you struggle in saying yeah, positive seriously. things about yourself? Okay. It's easier for me to point out the things that, that <laughs> I want to work on than the things I'm good at. But as I'm thinking about it, I'd say um, I'd say that I, I literally just lost it. I think my superpower is to be uh, like high emotional capacity, hmm. I'd say. Like, I feel like I can go from mm. one thing to the next thing and be able to, like, mm. carry my full self into that you well. Mm. That's great. And, uh, yeah, and I think my other superpower is being able to say the things that I want to say really quickly off the top of my head. Yes, that is definitely your superpower. Mm. Yeah. I'd say uh, both of those things. But, yeah, you are really, really, g- you're a quick thinker. I really admire that about you. Thanks, Ken. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I had that. I don't. I have to really think about stuff for a long time. Um, I'll say mine because it seems like we're going in a circle. Love that. I am really good at budgeting. Oh. Like I'm kind of a, John, Jono called it, he, he was like, you're, you're kind of a modern day coupon uh, clipper. Like there aren't really coupons anymore, but the, whatever the other version, like the modern version of that is where I'm really good at like saving up gift cards just the right way and using my stamp cards. Right. And I've got the credit card thing figured out for the points, but nothing, nothing else. Like I'm just, I'm good at kind of that hacking, is a superpower. hacking that stuff. Yeah. 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 I love that. It's a great answer. I don't know what I feel like the one that came to my mind is I'm really good at having the energy I need for whatever situation I'm in like mm-hmm. but I don't feel like that's been true lately <laughs> <laughs> like I just feel like I'm like that's not true for my life right now um mm. so it feels like I failed at my superpower but can I, I say know. one for you oh sure <laughs> I think you're really good at this is gonna sound lame but cleaning <laughs> I almost oh, said that so I almost said that but oh, I was like really? I always talk about cleaning on this yeah. freaking cleaning podcast. superpower but cleaning it's amazing but to watch. not just okay. not just are you actually good at the cleaning part but you're good at having a good attitude about it like oh, you I don't get cleaning. bitter about cleaning yeah. and that is a superpower so yeah. like after an event or after oh, some yes. kind of yeah and just every day like, yeah. you know yeah. It's wild. I, I just follow that, but then Molly's I feel like lead I talk in that. About okay. Cleaning too much. So yeah, I, I affirm 
your answer for me. And I appreciate that. <laughs> Incredibly efficient. Like, <laughs> like it's unreal, honestly, how efficient you are at cleaning. Like you'll watch the scene of her cleaning <laughs> and you'll scene. literally not the even scene. be able to like understand how she's doing it because it's so wow. focused. It's so well done. And it's also like, she knows exactly what she's doing at every oh single gosh, moment. I feel, like when I, wow. I feel like when I'm cleaning, Come I'm like on a Friday when I clean my house, it's kind of fun. I feel like when I clean, I'm like trying to find half the time spent trying to find the things <laughs> that I use to clean. Like, <laughs> yikes! Like, that's where, below where average. Where spray is this? And, yeah. Yeah. That's below average. Okay, I just so if we can, yeah, if we combined our superpowers into like a team, so like mm. kind of an Avengers. Yeah. Uh -huh. Think of what uh -huh. we could accomplish. Oh my god! Typing out things and cleaning <laughs> things and buying stuff and, buying stuff and uh -huh. being really efficient well, and then thinking of quick superhero, quick witted uh -huh. responses. Yes. That's could kind of amazing. really defeat some like threats Something. to this planet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know what it. I love that we did is um, my husband, Jono gave me the idea for this question, but the way he said it is he said, we should say for the person on our left, what we think their superpower is and uh. their everyday superpower. And I was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to change that a little bit because your everyday superpower is often like a really quirky little thing that we may not yeah. know about each other, but we ended up kind of doing that anyway. And you I just You did love say that. to the person on your left, which you is did. Molly. Yeah. Yeah. But that worked out. Yeah, and the person on my right. Yep, Jono was right. <laughs> yeah, we did it anyway. <laughs> I love the, that. The firmer you are, Ken. Yeah. And um, speaking of super natural abilities. <laughs> Where are you going to go <laughs> with this? This is the transition. Right? This is it. Okay, this is speaking it. Speaking of supernatural abilities, today we are going to talk about science. Oh! oh. Hey. 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 I was just like, there it is. I thought there was going to be more. And, and faith and how we can embrace both. We should have a sound effect every week after you put in that transition. It's yeah. like, oh. like, just like, I wish it just like do it. The transition of the week. Yes, the transition of the week or something. That would make me feel really epic. Like, uh -huh. the Legos uh, lasers. The pew, uh -huh. pew, pew. <laughs> yeah. Like, there was the transition. Yeah. Owen Thanks, Wilson. guys. <laughs> Going cool. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. If listeners, if you have any ideas for sound effects that we can um, throw in, the sound effects should go right after you let say, us know. Speaking of blank <laughs> sound effect, man, that's going to put a lot of pressure on it though. <laughs> yeah. Every that's time. The point. Yikes. <laughs> um, well, I am excited about our topic today. I feel like part of why we wanted to do this is we have been recognizing that a lot of people and us included, we have felt like this, that I feel like you have to kind of throw out a little bit of sci science to embrace faith or mm -hmm. a little bit of faith to embrace certain aspects of science. And we are here today to kind of challenge that and actually invite people into a more holistic view. And so, and that's actually also why we specifically have Brian on today. And Brian shared a little bit about <clears throat> his professional background in the last um, episode, but Brian, will you share a little bit more in this kind of context? what your background oh, is. Oh, sure. So uh, in high school, my English teacher taught me how to rock climb. And uh, that led me, because I love being outdoors. So in, as an undergraduate, it led me to getting a degree in geology. So you see Santa Barbara studied geology. I ended up loving geology. Geology is a narrative science. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I, I absolutely fell in love with that. Went to graduate school at Western, uh, so got my, my master's degree in um, uh, kind of a geophysical emphasis. So I got to go down to South America and do graduate work in geology in South America. And so I spent a big chunk of time in the academic geology world. And uh, then after graduating, uh, well, okay, so I also got an education degree and uh, found out that I really didn't want to teach high school <laughs> after teaching one year oh of high school. And I was at Meridian High School, fun fact. Oh, wow. I and didn't know that uh, I yeah, either. found out I'm not cut out to be a high school teacher. But then didn't you become a high school pastor? Well, okay, so that's, that's <laughs> part of the other story. So, Maybe for another time. <laughs> uh, but then I did prof professional geology for about 11 or 12 years, did consulting. Uh, at the same time, uh, I'm really fascinated in the history of science. Mm. So not just science as, uh, as a study itself, but the history and progression of science. For a while, did a lot of research about Isaac Newton 
And that period of time of his science, I ended up writing a book that I haven't published yet uh, about Newton as a... Uh, as a, uh, I wanted to learn about him, so I wrote a book. Oh my and gosh! So, so that's, cool. Yeah, so that's on. Yeah, that just dropped. Like it's sitting on the shelf. Oh just it needs one more revision. But wow. so I've had this deep, deep interest in science. Uh, but then also, I've been a pastor for um, for about uh, ten years, and I've been a Christian for since 1990. So, but about 30 years of of practicing faith along with about 30 plus years of either academic or professional mm. uh, interest in, mm-hmm. in science. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so in, in the academic world, I felt like, well, I'm sort of an oddball because of my faith practice. Mm. And then sometimes in the faith world, I felt like I'm some kind of an oddball because of my, uh, of my scientific background and I've always rejected those mm dichotomies mm, like, totally. no i've always rejected that yeah um, so that's yeah. what we're going to be talking about today so yes. a little bit about a little bit about me yeah and that's why we're so excited to have you on is because you've been both and are a practitioner of faith and a practitioner of science and throughout your professional life you've been able to really harmonize those mm-hmm. and we're excited to kind of have your voice on for that reason and you know because Brian is a pastor and an author and a scientist, a geologist, <clears throat> has been an academic. He is the most of an authority out of the four of us on this. <laughs> but we are going to talk about topics that we would none of us would say we are really yeah, authority. Yeah, and on. I would. I really <laughs> want to emphasize that I, yeah. I don't consider myself an authority or a theologian or a. I've studied some geology. I can say I know more about a teeny little area in Patagonia than anybody else, but I barely know anything about that area. Mm-hmm. I just know a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, I, I hope that I'm not coming across as like I'm some authority, but I have a story to tell, I think, totally. as part of my journey in life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I think, yeah, we just want to recognize um, this as we're as we're getting into this, that we don't consider ourselves authorities, but we do definitely have some things to share and an invitation for people really into wholeness. We want to kind of reject this dichotomy of like it's faith versus science. I don't know about you guys, but that's a phrase I feel like I hear a Mm -hmm. lot, faith versus science. And we want to really reject that and invite you to embrace both. And we're actually going to talk about it in this language of a material worldview and a spiritual worldview Mm -hmm. and how we can integrate those instead of saying faith versus science and that kind of thing. Um, So that's what we're going to be doing today. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm super excited about it. Um, So what I want to ask you guys, because like I said, we're inviting people into a more holistic worldview that embraces both spiritual and material. And there's a lot of things that I think are getting people in the way of that kind of whichever um, worldview comes more naturally to them or they're able to embrace more easily. It can be hard and there can be barriers to really embracing the other along with it. And so what are some of those barriers? barriers that you guys see that are getting in the way of wholeness. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the tensions that I have felt, uh, is, uh, a, a perspective of the Bible in Genesis one in particular, that the earth was created in six days, Mm. that there was, uh, that, we live in a young earth mm-hmm. uh, and that the cosmos is very young, say six to 7,000 years old. And that creates this sort of tension, especially when people start looking at geology and it's a science of, of millions and billions of years. And um, so that is a, uh, it's a huge obstacle that people mm, yeah. bump up against and then immediately are faced with this choice and think they either have to discard the Bible as, as authoritative or they're going to have to shut their brain off and they're not going to be able to explore some of the scientific ideas around right. either evolution yep. or old earth. Yeah. Yep. I totally agree, Brian. I feel like I remember when I was in high school, I, I might've shared this story in the podcast before, but uh, it's relevant to this. I remember when I was in biology class, I think it was probably my sophomore year. 
uh, and we were like, we're beginning our, our, our unit on evolution. And I was a Christian for like maybe a year. And I just like, I it, it probably came from narratives that maybe some family members had told me, or just broadly Christian culture had told me that, uh, that evolution was like essentially a lie. Like it, it wasn't what the Bible said. And so because it wasn't explicitly what the Bible describes as God's way of creation, then it's this idea of the world that we as Christians need to reject. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling that pressure like uh, in 10th grade and just like sitting there and the, and, and our teachers about to just be like, uh, teaches this content and I remember sitting there praying like God mm. give me strength to resist mm. like give me strength no. to like not believe this like give mm. me strength to just like have faith in you because I don't want to like doubt mm. because of what evidence is going to be shown to me wow. uh, and I remember I even <laughs> uh, I think at the time I thought this was faithful I look back at this with a lot of cringe now but <laughs> I I remember our our teacher <laughs> Our teacher had us uh, get into small groups and like each of us had posters and we were supposed to write down everything we knew at the beginning of this unit about evolution. Like what were the things mm. that we've heard about it? What are the things we knew? Just and I lies. rallied, I did. <laughs> no, you I rallied no, my, you my like classmates and like, and they happened to be Christians too. And I basically, I, yes, <laughs> I basically was like, Y'all, what we know is this isn't true. Like, mm. and <laughs> presented you it. You them, you're like yes, preaching at them. Presented it in front of the whole Yikes. class and was like, this is what I know about evolution. And then my, my teacher was like, <laughs> all right, thanks for sharing. Like, uh, so I definitely personally understand. Brian's like, this is why I didn't want to be a high school teacher. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I might have been teaching that. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, I, I, I really understand that tension because that's like what I felt for a long time. Totally. Mm -hmm. totally. What would you say is the fear that was within you? I mean, I know you talked about like the doubt and stuff, but when we're, as we're addressing these two kind of ends of the extreme, these, the spiritual worldview or this material worldview where mm -hmm. it feels like it's one or the other, what, I don't know, what were your fears? Mm. Or, sir, if you can kind of think back totally. to that place that, that you were afraid of coming into fruition or something like mm. that. I think at the time I was, I think at the time I was afraid that I would lose what I had like in God mm. if I started introducing these ideas that weren't like in my mind aligned with what I had thought I believed. And my belief back then was so tied to just God existing. Like I got to believe God exists because that's what it means for me to be a follower of Jesus mm. is kind of what I feel like it was so tied into. And so me introducing doubt made me feel like I wasn't having faith anymore. Uh, or me introducing this new information made me feel like that. And now I don't think I could have articulated it then. I can look back at that and say that I was just really insecure in my faith. Like mm -hmm. I was really insecure in like who I thought, what I thought about Jesus and what I really knew and what I really believed. And like, I think that that actually just brought out my own insecurities and, mm -hmm. and projections uh, rather than having the confidence and faith that I can enter into this conversation. Mm -hmm. Even if I didn't, like uh, lean towards believing it in it or anything. Uh, I didn't have the confidence in God or, or in my own faith to like wrestle with ideas that might challenge mm. something that I thought I had known. Uh, Josh, you you mentioned the, the role of doubt and I, I it strikes me that uh, if your faith has no room for doubt, then it's weak faith and I would also say if your science has no room for doubt, it's weak science. Mm. Uh, because I think in a, in a, cause faith isn't just, I, I believe that Jesus exists or I believe that God exists, but faith is this trusting uh, covenantal allegiance that we're, that we're swearing to, to God, that we're giving our allegiance to him. And that includes all of the doubts that are out there, mm. meaning I'm going to be with you, Jesus, through the ups and downs, where it's similar to, I think, a marriage covenant. Yeah. 
where the marriage covenant, we're saying, oh, I'm putting my faith in you, or I'm establishing a faithful relationship that's going to include all the ups and downs. And if, so if your faith doesn't allow the questions, that's a really small, confined place to be. And then I would also say as a scientist, if your science doesn't allow doubts or questions, you've left the realm of science. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, that science oh it has to allow for the doubt, has to allow for the testing, has to mm. allow right. for the disproving. So any science that doesn't allow for that is no longer science. Mm. Yeah, I, I kind of hear the language you're using in our common association with science is fact, mm-hmm. and our common association with faith is just like right blind belief. Yep. Or I mean, I don't know how I would exactly phrase that, but I think that there's, again, with these dichotomies, these seemingly contradictory things, Mm. science is like research-based and factual, and that's what science has to offer, which is, if that's the only thing, then it Mm. is seemingly contradictory to this you know, more like Mm. whimsical kind of belief Mm. that we have in faith. And I think we're trying to, we're trying to like break that open and, and expand both of the ideas of what science and faith have to offer and just kind of throw that contradictory nature out the window. Cause it's really not just like facts versus belief or I don't know. It yeah, just, it's 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 an easy association even for me to make in my brain. Yeah, mm-hmm. because the tension is, I think faith is is like you're saying, it's a belief in things that cannot be proven. Almost is what we right. what we mm-hmm. say, right. and science is an attempt at proving in in some ways. And so naturally, those feel op- opposed to one another. Mm-hmm. But I think I would I would challenge in saying that like we have faith, all of us, regardless of religion or not, have faith in things every single day, like. Mm. Like, and, and some things have, have more evidence behind the faith that we put into it than others. Uh, but like every time you, you like go in a green light, you have faith that someone's not going to pass the red light. Like Mm. every time, uh, Mm. like you, you, every time you sit down in a chair, you have faith that it's going to keep you up. Like there isn't any like certainty you like in most things that interact in life. Uh, and there's a level of faith that we all act upon in mm. all circumstances, even if that thing isn't 100% proven right in front of us. Uh, and so to say that that faith is opposed to science, I think is, is just, it can't be true because we, even people who wouldn't call themselves faithful in any ways or faith uh, filled people, yeah. uh, ha- integrate faith and science in their lives constantly all the time, every day. That's right. Uh, I think the space that we, we uh, that we want to move away from is uh, maybe if we call it ideology, which is a very narrow range of views that I'm only going to allow things that agree with my perspective, mm. which turns your world very, very small, and then you become shut off. And that happens, ideology happens on, uh, in a, in a religious context, it also happens in a scientific context. And so G.K. Chesterton has this, uh, his idea of insanity is not the absence of logic, but insanity is a very small circle of logic Mm. that tries to explain all of the cosmos. So you can create a teeny little circle of reason that that will explain all of the questions, but you're excluding so much and, and, and at the end of the day, I think what you end up excluding is wonder. Mm-hmm. If you're a Christian who is so locked down and is, is, is rejecting an exploration of the material world through science, you're rejecting a whole avenue of wonder. Mm. And if you're a scientist who's rejecting any kind of uh, spiritual worldview, then you're, you're, you're cutting off a source of wonder and I think what we're advocating for in, when we're saying wholeness is that um, uh, there's a place where you can live that integrates these two. Mm-hmm. That yep. doesn't answer all the questions, because I don't think we want to live in a place where we have all the questions answered, but where we can hold these right. two and we can live in them. Yep. I think the thing... Uh, 
in, that relates to evolution in this topic that I actually think is all, all, somewhat the source of where we, uh, especially if we call ourselves uh, Christians, where, where this dissonance occurs is, is I think in our interpretation of scripture and, and the way that we read the Bible and, and our often fundamentalist approach to reading scripture. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so like, for example, Genesis, uh, we, the reason why it's seen as like, we have to hold this thing so tightly is uh, as, as Christians, there's, there's like the, there's a belief obviously that scripture is inerrant and infallible. Mm-hmm. And then to say that, no, this scientific thing actually like is opposed to that thing that your scripture says. When then, you sit, when you're talking about Genesis, are you talking about the seven day creation? Story? Yes. The seven day creation story. Yep. And, and, and when we bring something into that, it makes us, if that's not true, hmm. then it's like, well, then is any of it true? Is kind of the right. feeling that I think it gives. Right. House um, of cards. Yes. Mm-hmm. The whole thing just mm-hmm. blows up immediately. Mm-hmm. And I think that that comes very much from just a literal interpretation of what Genesis is going doing. But it also reveals a little bit of like, our Western American way yeah, of totally. interpreting mm-hmm. the Bible uh, w- in ways that the Bible was never trying to explain. Like, yeah. so the, the way that we take Genesis creation story and say, this is trying to explain the way that the, that creation happened or the world mm-hmm. occurred. That's what we interpret it to mean. Mm-hmm. But we cannot as 20, 21st century Americans uh, take an ancient text mm. and then put ourselves into that context and say, this is what it means exactly for me in my context. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, because that, that, that 100% is not what's occurring there in Genesis. Yeah. Uh, Genesis, like uh, we could probably even include some resources in the show notes and everything, but Genesis uh, is, is a text that is in conversation with creation stories at the time is of its, of its existence. It's uh, it's, it's speaking directly to it, its own narrative and its own context that we have to do our best to like come into and try to understand so yes. that we can actually understand the, the fullness and the beauty of what scripture is trying to reveal to us. Uh, I, uh, an example that I really like uh, that I've heard of this is uh, Tim, Tim Mackey um, has shared how even the first few words of the Bible were in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We, we read that and we interpret that as like, all right, heavens and the earth, like what's like the, mm. the heavens. And then we interpret the earth as like the planet that we live on. Mm-hmm. Like, but at the time, they didn't know they existed on a planet. Mm -hmm. Like they didn't Mm -hmm. even, there was no picture of a globe. There was no picture of, of the earth in the way that we interpret it. And so even then you have to stop and go, okay, what's it saying here? Like, Mm. and, and, and all it's saying is God created what's up there and what's down here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. And, but then we get to the Genesis creation story and this is, uh, this is a story that is trying to talk about how God created order out of chaos. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we could, like I said, we'll include resources on this, but some things that I've heard and learned about this is uh, also from the Bible project uh, is that the narrative of what pre-creation meant at that time uh, was more so that everything, it wasn't that there was nothing or that there was non-existence, it, that there was chaos. And so you read in the Genesis creation story, the waters existed and they were just, uh, there was this great abyss mm-hmm. and God's spirit hovered over the waters and then he created order mm-hmm. out of this disordered chaotic space and then he, he created night and day and he created time and he created this uh, he, he ordered the animals and the way that the, the yeah. uh, creation exists. And I think like the more we can enter into the narrative of scripture itself and rather than assume the narrative on our, on our own, the more we can actually enter into these conversations about science and faith and actually embrace wholeness and say, huh, mm. maybe this isn't opposed to, to God. Maybe this isn't opposed to the scriptures that, that I hold so dearly. Mm. Uh, cause we're not ever going to tell you not to hold them dearly. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's right. uh, and I think that it's comes from such a great place. Like my desire to defend God and not 
like give into evolution <laughs> we came from a Kevin. really <laughs> yeah. great spot yeah. like that came from a spot right. of like man i want to be faithful right. yeah. uh and i think that what we hope to do is help you see that you can 100 percent be faithful and also like ask questions about science and how that might integrate into your uh into your spiritual mm-hmm. worldview yeah yeah similarly to what you were saying josh about how you know, I can't remember if you're saying you feel like other people feel like this or you had felt like this, but I have felt before, like if the seven day creation story isn't true, how can you trust that any of the rest mm-hmm. of it is true? I've certainly felt like that. And, you know, it brings to mind something that I think it's Tim Mackey who also says it, like the text wasn't written to answer questions that weren't being asked. Yeah, And I just, it makes me think about how we define truth. I think that has been what has expanded my vision a lot around this is um, there's an example that Garrett's given on the podcast before I think about like if Picasso or any great artist does a self portrait and it's not a photograph, it's a painting, it's a self portrait. Mm. So it, it, it maybe looks like them, but it's maybe abstract or, you know, the colors are different than their actual tones or whatever it is would you say that is not true would mm-hmm. you say that piece is not mm-hmm. true Good. and i think that's a really great example because we wouldn't say it's not true we would just say it, it tells a different truth than maybe a photograph yeah. would it it gives a different aspect of truth it tells the truth about what how that artist sees themselves like there may be meaning in the color they chose like there's just different meaning that that reveals mm-hmm. than the meaning of a simple photograph and that kind of example to me has just cracked open like what does it mean for something to be true and Mm. how do we define truth yeah it's such a good it's a it's an important question and i think um we owe it to ourselves to do the work and not take a lazy approach to it yeah right right i think because it's pretty easy to go one or two layers deep learn a couple little taglines and a couple little Mm -hmm. neat little sayings that make sense and then stop. And if we stop with, uh, with a few minutes or hours of looking at the issue, we haven't done it justice. So I think part of what we would encourage in the move towards wholeness is if it's important to you, actually do the work. Mm. Read across the spectrum. Listen across the spectrum to people who maybe even line up on different sides. And uh, and that's I, I, I strongly encourage that. Mm. I really do. Because if yeah. and if you're said and if you're aligned towards I would just want to find out what's true. That's not a bad way to live your life. Right, totally. You're not going to get really far off if your heart's desire is, I want to explore what's actually true yeah. and see where that journey takes you. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Brian, was, what was that? And we were in our planning session. You were sharing about a book on, on this. So uh, it's John Walton, The Lost World of Genesis 1, is, is easily the best uh, resource that I've seen on, on how... Uh, what was the reason that Genesis was was written to a late Bronze Age culture in Mesopotamia, mm. and understanding what was important to them will will address the reason the book was written. And if you mm. dig into it, the book wasn't written in order to give infinite de- and small details on how mm, the mechanism right. of creation or right. even when or the duration of creation. By far, if you look at the text, it's spent uh, on who created. Mm. They wanted to establish mm. that the God of Israel was the one who actually created the heavens and the earth. And that's what's most important about the text. Mm. That it wasn't a competing deity. It was that, no, actually, the creator is God, not necessarily how he created. And so, mm-hmm. so John Walton argues that, that the Bible is essentially silent on how old is the earth mm-hmm. and what was the mechanism that God used to create. Mm-hmm. So, so that gives actually, that yeah. c- then it would be okay if God chooses to use, say, a big bang and billions of years of process, or if he wanted to create life through a mechanism of, of 
slow, sequential, evolving and changing, that that would be okay. The text doesn't argue one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Now, personally, like I, I believe in an old earth. I think the earth is 4.6 billion years old-ish. I think that probably creation is a, uh, is a force of, of origins of life, but I don't believe that that can happen independent of God. Mm-hmm. So I kind of take a little bit of a modified view and mm. that I think evolution is a, is, a, is a viable mechanism of creating life, but not by itself. Mm. So personally, I think that there's major gaps in evolutionary theory that's, if it's independent from God. So, for example, the fossil record is really scarce in transitional species. Mm-hmm. It preserves thousands of species, but hardly any transitional species between this, this one and that one. Almost none. Mm-hmm. There's very few. So you could say, well, it's just that the rock record didn't preserve the transitional species, but then it would seem like it was just picking on the transitional species and selecting those out and what gets preserved. So, so for me, that's a problem, Mm. but I can hold evolution as a theory and say, yeah, but there's problems with it. Mm. Right. Yeah. Right. There's, I think there's problems in the very earliest ages of the earth billions of years ago with, with ultraviolet light. Like how did these primitive species resist ultraviolet light. I think it's a problem. Mm. How did they resist oxygen, which is a poison and the development of ways of processing oxygen? Like, you know, so I'm, so I would say, and I think I'm comfortable because I can hold a theory without being super dogmatic about it, even evolution. Mm. Yeah. So as, as, um, at least I'm saying I, I allow room for doubt in the way that I hold yeah, right. evolution, I'm yeah. open to. I go, no, there's some problems and some tensions there that that are difficult for me. Mm-hmm. But for everybody that's just as dogmatic about seven day literal creation, they'll have a dog dogmatism with with ev- evolution as well. Mm-hmm. And their fear would be if you question it even just a little bit or address problems, it's going to crumble like a house of cards. Right. Mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. So I see the same problem on on yeah. the two, two ends. ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah, and you're saying that by holding it open-handed a little bit and still having conviction but also yep. being like no you're leaving room for wonder. You're leaving room for that I think space. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I think so. And I think living in that space also gives a, a sense of security that you're describing either of these other places don't have. Like yep. if you feel like your whole ideology could crumble mm. if one thing is proven not true and so you just close your eyes right. to anything yeah. that you feel like might threaten that yeah that's not faith or science like no, that right. is a place of of insecurity fear. Fear. insecurity yeah. probably arrogance also mm, yeah. yeah if i am so absolutely convinced right. that i have nothing else to learn mm, right and so can i bring newton in on this please okay, do so so he was a really interesting <laughs> a little sneak guy peek into your yeah, book sneak peek of newton. so so uh First of all, um, he, he published this text. It's called, I have to, I can't pronounce it, so i got to read it. Philosophi- Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> all right, it's hard to say. <laughs> it's even hard, harder to understand. I don't understand half of it. Not even a third of it. Okay, but it's where the book that he published that has the laws of gravity, mm. he codified the laws of gravity. He wrote it in his 20s. It's an absolute <laughs> brilliant masterpiece. And, I, uh, and, and it's funny, he wrote it during a time of pandemic, so it would be like his version of the COVID, which they <laughs> called the plague. He goes home from school and he writes probably the most significant scientific text oh my gosh, yeah, in the history of doing? the world. Right? <laughs> so, right. How did it? Oh, I did some Zoom calls. Yeah. And like, but what's really interesting, the back third of the, the it's called the Principia. The Principia is his theology. Mm. A full third of the most important scientific text ever written Mm. contains his theology. And I would probably debate with him a little bit about some of his theology, but nevertheless, he was a whole person Mm. in that he viewed the cosmos through both a spiritual and a material lens. Mm. 
he was a whole person. And I think it's so fascinating mm-hmm. that yeah. that is a picture of a person who was seeking truth and he didn't have to sacrifice half of who he was mm-hmm. for his pursuits mm-hmm. of the other. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And that's a model that we, we want to embrace. Like it's just, as you're saying, Brian, and, and kind of how I opened the episode, you don't have to sacrifice part of your humanity yeah. to embrace either science or faith. Like yeah. in, mm-hmm. to do both is um, a wholeness so that you can't have when you just shut your eyes tight to one or the that's other right. out of fear. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. I think what we've been saying in a lot of different ways from different perspectives is what I think a lot of people get held up on, particularly those who lean more towards the material worldview. I think from conversations I've had and just perspectives that I've seen, what prevents people that lean more towards the material worldview side from experiencing wholeness is the unexplainable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The unexplainable Mm -hmm. elements of faith. And, as I've been thinking about like how, where is the invitation to wholeness there? Where is the invitation to kind of leave one side of the spectrum and move towards the middle is what we've all been saying in different ways is actually highlighting that no matter where you fall, there are unexplainable things about life on earth Mm. everywhere. (laughs) Whether you're looking from a scientific perspective, whether you are approaching it from a faith perspective, um, I, I don't know why, and maybe maybe this isn't the broad perspective, but I think there is this narrative that, again, like science is fact. Mm. Science is proof. Science is evidence of just the way things are. But there is so much unexplainable yes. things. Like yeah. There are so many unexplainable things in science. We see and hear stories of people whose bodies are healed. Like Mm. science cannot explain what has happened when they go in for a scan and they like see cancer on the scan and then they go in and it is gone like that. There are story after story of that happening. There are things that we do not understand. Like you were saying, Brian, like you know a very little about this specific (laughs) area in Patagonia, but like, you know, more than almost anybody, Yeah. but there, like, there's so much about our world and creation and the ocean and plants that we just like can't explain and don't understand. And yet we hold space for that. Like there's almost an acceptable comfortable way that we hold space for that. Cause it's like, Oh, well we just don't know yet. Like the proof right. is available, but we just don't have it yet. Mm. But I, I guess I'm just trying to offer the perspective that if you find yourself leaning more towards the material worldview and that is preventing you from exploring the idea of faith in something unseen. Mm. I actually want to offer that maybe you have more faith in something unseen than you're aware of. It's good. Mom. Um, yeah. Just, but there's like a cultural acceptance of that. And no matter what, like we have faith in something unseen, whether that's in science that has yet to be discovered or whether that's in a creator of the universe. Mm. Um, and so I don't know. I think, that is something that prevents people from having wholeness, but I actually think can be an invitation to experience wholeness if we if we see it from a different perspective. Yeah, it's something mm-hmm. like two thirds of the matter in the universe is this stuff called dark matter yeah. that we don't even know what right? it is. What two is, thirds like, what of it. We have no just clue. Think about it. So we're just going to come up with a fancy name. We're going to call it dark matter, <laughs> but we have no idea. Right. And you get to. As soon as you start getting, like, uh, it, there's a problem with kind of granularity. So mm-hmm. the things that are right in front of us, we can see with a fairly high resolution. But then once you start going back in time, if you track through, even you track through the Big Bang, and they think they have a pretty good idea, astrophysicists, what happens in the first few milliseconds after the Big Bang, But once you get really close to the Big Bang itself, or even a second before the Big Bang, there's 
absolutely no idea. And it's mystery and it's wonder because how does something spring out of nothing? Mm. Or uh, it also the smaller you get in scale so we can kind of understand a hand and how that works. But if you zoom in to a cell, then the workings of the cell, a little bit more mysterious, you zoom in even more. Now we're getting on the electronic scale and then you get into the mm. subatomic uh, scale and you start getting right. smaller and smaller. And it turns out that all of our stuff is absolutely filled with mystery and wonder. Mm. I want to read this scripture in Hebrews 11, the very beginning. It says, now faith, this thing we've been talking about, faith is confidence in what we hope for Mm. and assurance about what we do not see. Mm. This is what the ancients were commended for. Mm. The next scripture is, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Mm-hmm. I just think this is such a beautiful description, honestly, like a kind of summary of what we're talking about. Yeah. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Obviously, this passage, the writer of Hebrews is talking about like our belief in our creator God. But I think that that idea like could be used to define what mm. faith in anything is. Faith is mm-hmm. confidence Good. in what you hope for yeah. and assurance in what you do not see. Mm-hmm. Like, you can't see the atoms that make up your body, but there's a like assurance in what you can't see because of like an understanding Mm. of an accepted Mm. reality that researchers have, you know, come to an understanding of this Mm. and published theories and, and Mm. et cetera. I don't have all the correct scientific (laughs) wing. I'm just like kind of saying things, but (laughs) like, right. I'm like, right, Brian. (laughs) But um, yeah, I just think that kind of supports what we were talking about Mm. of wherever you fall on the spectrum from material to spiritual worldview, you have an assurance likely in something that you cannot see. Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, so when uh, in the late 1800s, uh, Isaac Newton was dethroned because his, um, you know, his new, what they call Newtonian physics uh, essentially was, was the laws of nature until quantum mechanics came around. And they discovered that Newton was wrong when it comes down to very small scale, that his laws don't apply Mm. if you get really small. And that just shattered Mm. the scientific Mm. community. That what we thought was absolute law, right? Mm. (laughs) Like, Mm. I mean, force equals mass times uh, times acceleration. Like, it just as basic as it can get. It's just true. Uh, When you get really teeny... Mm all of those laws go out the window Mm -hmm. and they don't apply. And so Newton himself was dethroned. And that would be like, that science was quote unquote, as settled as you can get Mm. until Einstein comes around, Mm -hmm. right? Until the quantum physics come around. Mm -hmm. And so then, uh, so what, so just picture the person who's holding on and says, no, I refuse to allow any kind of new science or any kind of new understanding that science right. then becomes ideology, which then turns your world into a teeny little cell. Actually, it imprisons you. Mm-hmm. If you're an ideologue, you're imprisoned in what you believe in this narrow circle of logic. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. so, I mean, those, those are just, that's a, that's a huge example in the scientific world is even what you think is most basic, mm. it's very difficult to hold on to. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm thinking of, like, at one, t- at one point, it was, like, fact that the Earth was flat. <laughs> like, yeah, right. <laughs> right. Like, Based uh, on the observations and I mean, available. Is it? <laughs> Oh my gosh! Based on, based on the <laughs> observations so available, like, I hold this with open hands. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but obviously, like we know that things like information changes, and like you're saying, Brian, more is revealed, and then that adjusts our faith in the information yeah. that's being revealed to us. Yeah. Uh, and I think, like, what th- this is making me think of is, I think there's actually something really beautiful in our human experience and our humanity to have the freedom to not know everything. Like I think that there's some, probably within the last few hundred years, more of a pressure to 
like understand all the things and to and knowledge is is wisdom and knowledge is like this attainable mm -hmm. uh like thing that we can grasp and it makes us grow and whatever. But I think that there's something actually really beautiful about looking at like, mm. like the stars at night and just like yeah. being That's in right. wonder and not knowing how this is. And, and like just like gazing upon beauty and beauty being something that is just like so intangible mm. and yet it's so like core to our human experience. Yeah. And so if we purely land only in the material world and say, this is all that is, and this is all that can be, then we miss out on what we all know is also true mm. about our experience mm. uh, that isn't and can't be grasped simply by material means. Uh, and that, 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 that's our feelings and our emotions and our, and our, and beauty and, and in our desire to like care and help for other people that we don't even know about. Like, I think the example that comes into my brain is like, if we don't, if, if all things are just, uh, the result of, uh, random randomness colliding together, mm -hmm. uh, there's no reason to care, uh, about uh, humanitarian crises. Like there's no reason to budget <laughs> none really well <laughs> or clean stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like truly really, when, really. when, yeah. yeah. when an earthquake wipes out a, a, mm -hmm. a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. all of us have an innate, like I That's want, right. I, I care about that. Like I, right. I, I, I care about those people. I hope that they're doing well. Like we, we mm. give money. We really like contribute to the things that we want to improve and, and help others. But if we're just purely material worldview, then uh, that's just natural selection at work. Like, mm. and, and it is what it is. And, and why should we care about that? Cause it sucks for them. Yeah. Survival of the fittest. Yeah. Uh, and that's just the progress of how things work. But I think we all know that's not how we think. Like we all know that that's not true to our experience. And so I think that there's a level of like, then what's that mean about who we are and, and mm. why we're that way? And uh, I think C.S. Lewis said that if the universe had no meaning, we never should have found out that it had uh, <laughs> right. had nice. any me uh, had no meaning because... Nice. Mm. Uh, Can you say that again. <laughs> if the universe had no meaning, then we never should have found out that it had no meaning. Uh huh. Got it. Because then now we have a conceptualization of that. Mm. Right. Got it. Got yes. It. Mm. I think what you're pointing to is this idea that keeps floating around in my head this whole time is just if we if there is creation, there is creator. Like just mm -hmm. the idea of yeah, we are created beings. And this is my, obviously my perspective from a Christian point of view and a Christian understanding, but that's what I personally always come back to when I wrestle with these ideas. And when I, mm. you know, come to a place where I'm like, but how does that make sense? How does, how does this make sense? When I'm in conversation with people, I am always rooted in what I believe is true about a creator and his creation mm. that there is purpose and intent in the world. Josh, like you're saying there is, we are made like we are created with purpose and we were given value and there's value and beauty in the world that points to the one who created it. Mm. And I just, that is always when I'm wondering about like, what's the point of anything? Like, there's so much brokenness in the world. How do I understand the gospel? I always come back to my understanding of the reality that there is a creator and that we are his creation. Mm. And that that's just the thing that for me is the anchor point of, I don't know, how to take all of the stuff that we're talking about it and hold it yeah. tightly yeah. and openly at the same time, I guess. <laughs> I think I, I'm wanting people to examine their fears mm -hmm. on either side. So whether it's a, a, a material worldview or more of a spiritual word, worldview, it, take a close look at the fear. Because I would say one fear is something like this. Well, one of the errors is that, that reason that eliminates faith 
reason that eliminates faith denies the creator of the world. Mm-hmm. And faith that eliminates reason denies the world of the creator. Mm. Both of those things have Mm. tragic consequences i think Mm. and both of those things spring out of fear that oh no what if i'm wrong right we're either going to deny the creator of the world or we're going to deny the world of the creator and we're going to lose something that's too great because of fear so my encouragement Mm. here's the lord of the rings i gotta pull it out josh let's go i've been waiting (laughs) is that you have to be able to leave the shire Mm. If you're setting up in your comfort little hobbit hole of whatever that worldview is, mm. the tiny circle of logic, and you have it all figured out, you're smoking your pipe and you're eating your cheese and bread and you're just so <laughs> you got comfortable your hairy feet. in those. You got your hairy feet. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, this, is a, this is a hobbit thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've never seen this. So okay. I'm, like, yeah, I'm, so I'm you would know. for the pipe okay. and the cheese. Yeah. But. <laughs> okay, so... What we're saying is leave the Shire, get out there, discover, and there's risk. You might yeah. find that you're going to lose something. Mm. You might find that part of your world gets blown apart, mm. but it's mm. worth it. It's worth leaving the Shire. It's worth taking the adventure, go into the dark forest, go into the unknown, even go into a, an area that might just seem like chaos for you, but that's what... That's where the beauty is. Mm. That's where you're going to grow. That's where the learning is. And, and so what, whatever spectrum you find yourself on uh, is be willing to, uh, to get out. Mm, yeah. Leave the Shire. Yeah, totally. Pack your bag. Yeah, and, th- and honestly, that wisdom doesn't just apply to this topic either. True. That, that right. really, like, to cultivate a, like a <coughs> mental resilience I I guess I I sometimes observe in myself and in our culture as a whole an unwillingness to be like intelligently challenged and that that feels like we said that that flares up our insecurity and our fear, but to be willing to be like, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. And Mm. I'm like, I'm learning stuff today and I'm learning stuff tomorrow and I don't have to know it all right now. And I don't have to be afraid of being challenged because I'm on a journey into like, allow the humility of that to really satiate the our whole lives like the way that we read the way mm. that we ask questions the way that we speak to others the way we speak to ourselves the way we pray the way we research mm. to let that wisdom really dictate our posture in all of it yeah yeah Brian, could you share um, just that brief story that you talked about before you were a Christian when you were looking at the sunset? Like just that example. Oh, right. Do you remember when you were talking about that? Yeah, I think there's something in us, whether you're Christian or not, uh, if you see a sunset that's just absolutely beautiful or that night sky in the desert and the and the Milky Way is out and there's a jillion stars, there's something inside of you that goes, oh, you can't even help it. Mm-hmm. Your body is is making an involuntary reaction to the beauty that's before you. And I think that's worship. Mm-hmm. It's a response to wonder. And I think we were designed and created for wonder. That we're, it's involuntary almost. It's like you see something that's spectacular and you just go, oh. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be even even in creation, if you see something amazing in athletics or on a right. football field, they'd like there's an involuntary, everything inside you is going, yes. And, and that's a response to wonder. It's mm. your body is, is crying out involuntarily. Mm. And if you're not willing to go on the journey, what you're going to sacrifice is wonder. Mm. Yeah, I think about it as... Like when you're saying it's not just nature, it's when you see people being, that's how I think about it, Mm. who God made them to be. That's right. When you see people reflecting their createdness, the intelligent design that they were made with. This is so cheesy, but... I always like tear up and get like choked up at like standing ovations. Like if I'm like watching like a a show, like a, like a theater performance or a concert, like something like that. And like, 
that moment when like everybody mm. stands up. I don't know if I've like ever really talked about this before. Like, <laughs> or like crossing the finish line at a race. Like these mm. really, I don't know, these moments like, it's like this bodily yeah. response mm-hmm. yeah. where I can't help it. And I always wondered for a while, like, I don't know, like I'm not like that into like performances. Like why do I get so, mm. like it could be like a children's theater and like everyone's like <laughs> standing up. Like that and mushroom like, just nailed so it. Like, look at that. <laughs> that kid is the best mushroom <laughs> ever. Seriously. Yeah. And the more I thought about that, I think I was reflecting on that truth of, when you see someone doing something where you look at them and you go, they were made for that. Mm. You are worshiping too, because you yeah. are seeing the image of God, like that's right. Fulfilled yeah. in its glory yeah. in the way that someone's choosing to live their life in the way that someone's reflecting God's goodness back to the world yes. through their hobby, right. through their gift, through their talent. Mm. And, and we see that in nature too. And so, uh, yeah, that, that to me is like, man, we are creation made with intent mm. with an understanding of who our creator is that sometimes mm. we don't have mm. the words for, but is, is like a part of us. Well, and that's wholeness. Mm-hmm. That mm. is wholeness. Mm. Yeah. You can live in that. Like I, I, okay, sorry, Brian, keep going. Yeah. I think um, that instead of thinking of science versus faith or science versus God, uh, think about how complementary they are. So if yeah, you're a right. Christian and, and, like when I'm doing my geology, when I was out in Patagonia and I'm studying the rocks, that was such a worshipful experience oh, for I'm me. Sure. Cause Lord, look at what you made and look at how spectacular that is. And it really drove me. It was a motivator. I want to learn and understand mm. as much as I can. Or if you're a scientist, it's like, so I think that, that Newton was, was highly motivated by his faith. Mm. The reason why he studied and wanted to understand the mm. universe was because he knew that the more he understood, the more glory mm. was going to go to God. Mm. That the deeper you mm. understand yeah. the material world, it just reflects in wonder mm. <laughs> of how amazing a creator would be who could make yeah. something like yeah. that. So I really see a harmony in in, in those two things that they're feeding off one another and one is driving right. the other and the other is driving the one. And it's just like, that's a beautiful way to live. Mm. Yeah, totally. I was just going to say, and I'm going backwards a little bit, but I all I was picturing is Molly being in the crowd of like a third graders play and there being a tree. <laughs> like, go, and yes. Molly's just like, look at that kid be that tree. <laughs> they were made exactly to do. what they were made to do. <laughs> like, maybe uh, I stretched it a little bit with the children's performance. Yeah. So. <laughs> She's like, I shouldn't have admitted this. <laughs> but I do, we all have our versions of that. I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I, I can imagine what those are for me. It's never, ever been in children's performance. What's that movie where at the very oh. end, there's that little girl. Oh, it's, um, this is so stupid. It's the greatest showman. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah. At the end, it just made me think of this. There's that little girl and she's like dancing as the tree on stage. And yes. It's, so, it's such a beautiful it's little so movie. Oh, okay. Honestly, isn't there a movie called Wonder? Where the kid, oh, wait, uh, the yeah, and they give a standing relation to him at the end mm. of the movie. Oh, that sounds like it's your sweet spot. <laughs> oh, seriously, <laughs> perfect. Okay, I have to share one funny anecdote that I was thinking about earlier when we were talking about um, like Big Bang and evolution. Is anybody watch Love Is Blind here? Oh yeah, no. I do. And there's that one couple from season two and they like broke up because one was an atheist and one was a Christian. Yes. And I just remember yes. this very specific exchange where he was like, do you believe in evolution? And she was like, no. And he goes, Oh, I believe in the big bang. And I was like, this is just like, <laughs> this is just so and terrible. They broke up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they broke up. Oh my goodness. Yeah, they needed to listen to this podcast. <laughs> so this, and, and so just so I think people should know, this is a fairly recent kind of separation between, Mm. science and faith it's like late 1800s where i would say the the divorce papers were signed Mm. where you had to choose Mm. either to Mm. be um, have a material worldview or a spiritual worldview so that's not very long ago Mm -hmm. and so francis schaeffer is a theologian he calls that the line of despair that Mm. after that mark where we're gonna have to pick 
either mm-hmm. I can be a person of faith or, a, but not both, mm-hmm. yeah. that that actually was in the roots of a lot of the horrors of the, the 20th century. Mm-hmm. Like 20th century was not a pretty century in terms of just mass humanity and mass slaughter. and ma- It was a bad century. Mm-hmm. So Schaefer argues that, that those horrors were tied to what happens if you rip humanity in half and wow. you make them choose. Mm. Wow. Yeah, wow. So you're saying that love is blind couple wouldn't have had to break up in exactly. the 1700s. Just stay together. That's exactly what I was trying That's to say. The point you're but you just captured. I couldn't I couldn't actually get there. But you, Do you got know what it I'm there. talking about? Kevin? I 100% know what you're talking about. I just watched that episode like 3 days ago. And I was wow. laughing out loud at like, their come conversation. On, Netflix like why are you going to portray this I like know, this? Anyways, mm. it was something else. Um Well, if you're a regular listener, you know that we often end our episodes with a way to like ways to find rest in the context of the topic that we're talking about. And I actually think it's more appropriate with this topic to invite you instead of to invite you into rest, actually invite you into challenge Yep. to invite you that wherever you find yourself on this kind of spectrum from like pride, like, like solely material worldview to solely you know, Christian or spiritual worldview, wherever you find yourself on that spectrum to move more toward the middle, that challenge to move more toward wholeness, like a holistic Mm. worldview that integrates um, both a faithfulness and a sense of wonder and also a recognition of the reality of science, all of it together. And and to experience the peace that you can find there, Mm. um, I think, I think the challenge it takes you to get there leads you to a sense of rest and comfort. Mm. Um, So that's what I want to invite listeners into. Uh, I'd like to offer a, I was calling it a bookshelf challenge, (laughs) but it could also be a podcast challenge. So um, it's something like this. Take a picture of your bookshelf right now and look at how, how many of uh, the books on your shelf would fit into a strictly material worldview mm. or a spiritual worldview? Or take a look at your podcast list. How many sources of information mm. are mm-hmm. feeding one worldview? And in six months, if you haven't broadened that spectrum, if you hadn't added books to your shelf or podcasts to your playlists mm. that are... Uh, are challenging a uh, an ideological worldview, then you're not growing. Mm. If you're only listening to things that you only agree with, you're not going to grow. So I want to just I want to issue that challenge of of take a picture of that right now and what does it look like six months from now? If in six months from now you're listening to sources that are quite different than what you're comfortable with Mm -hmm. and we're not saying you have to agree. Right, absolutely. We're not even saying that you're not going to arrive back at the same place where you are right now, but if you don't go on the journey, you're you're missing something. Mm -hmm. So it would be okay if you take that journey and at the end of the day you go, I don't think evolution is true. But at the very least, that okay, that's okay. At least you're doing some of the work. Yeah. And you're opening yourself up to, that, uh, that you might be wrong. Mm-hmm. And the same if you're in a material worldview. So can we call it the podcast challenge or I what do you want to call it? Yeah, yeah. To take a Let's screenshot okay. resource challenge. Yeah. Yeah. That's there you it. go. Well, that sure. kind of sounds boring, yeah, but sorry. Resource <laughs> challenge. Take a picture or a screenshot and set an actual reminder in your phone for yeah. six months from now. Yeah. I would say people should do that. There we go. Mm. Yeah. I love it. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, like it, subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications so you can stay tuned for all of our content.